The material we've covered up to this point has been absolutely essential to create the proper mental environment and prepare you for the information that's coming. I concluded the last message by suggesting you reread page 8 as it was vitally important. Now we're going to create this image and as I do, I want to suggest that you take as many notes as you can. It really doesn't matter if you have to replay this next section 50 times. Make sure that you get the key points written out on page 9 in your action planner. It's vitally important that you do this. The success of the entire program, which is your future, may be dependent upon it. I know you'll do well. Now let's start to think. Here we're talking about this power. We are not only a physical expression of that power, we're an instrument of that power because that power literally flows to and through us. Now, as it flows into our consciousness, it just is. Just is. All science and all theology tells you energy is, God is, is neither created nor destroyed, is the cause and effect of itself, is 100% evenly present in all places at all times, is all-knowing, is all-powerful. You see, the knowledge that got us into the air has always been here. We didn't just make something out of nothing. When the Wright brothers introduced us to this new kingdom, they just tapped into something that was already here. The fax machine that you use today. You can take a slip of paper, feed it into a machine, and thousands of miles away, simultaneously, it's coming out of somebody else's machine. And it's all done just through passing something through the medium of the molecule, the no thing. We've always been able to do that. We've just become aware of how to do it. See, a person that's earning $25,000 a year, they're not earning $25,000 a year because they want 25 a year. They're earning 25 a year because they're not aware of how to earn 50. Any person in this room can become financially independent. There's no trick to it. This afternoon we're going to talk about that a little bit. As this power flows in, it's neither negative or positive. Jan, I'm going to tell you there's nothing on the cover of that book. Am I right or wrong? I'm wrong. Do you want to stand up for a second, Jen? You want to get a nice shot of this lady? She's a pretty <laughs> student. All right. I'm going to tell you they were never like this when I went to school. All right. Now, Jen, you're looking at the cover of this book. And I'm telling you there's nothing there, but in your mind, your eyes are telling you there is something there. Is that correct? That's correct. Let's let the camera have a shot of this. You see, there is print on the cover of this book. It says, Think and Grow Rich. And that's what Jan is looking at. And when I tell her there's nothing there, she is bound to tell me I'm wrong. Now, Jan, let's look at the other side of the book. I'm going to tell you there's nothing on the book. What do you say now? Now I'm right. You're right. Now I'm right. <laughs> minute ago is wrong, and now I'm right. Thanks very much, Jan. All right. Now, what did we do here? We just turned the book around. Somebody say, well, that's a cute little trick you pulled on Jan. And if that's where we stopped it, that would be right. But John talked about laws earlier this morning. He was talking about the action-reaction being equal and opposite. As you sow, so shall you reap. Energy always returns to its source of origination. Well, you know, there's other laws. That's not the only law. There are seven laws. Dr. Werner von Braun one time pointed out that the natural laws of this universe are so precise that you and I don't have any difficulty today building a spaceship, we can send a person to the moon, and we can literally time the landing with the precision of a fraction of a second. He also said these laws must have been set by someone. Now, the law that I'm referring to here is not the law of cause and effect or sowing and reaping. It's the law of polarity or the law of opposites. You see, Jan, there's a front to the book and there's a back to the book. There's a right and a left to the book. And what's right to me is left to you. There's a top and a bottom to the book. There's an inside and an outside to the book. And you couldn't have one without the other. If I started to slice the right side off this book, would have taken the last slice for the right side off, I've also gotten rid of the left. You couldn't possibly have one without the other. Nothing complicated about that. Pretty simple idea. 
but not understood by many people. We use these two symbols to illustrate the law of opposites. And you know, as this power flows into us, we can make out of it anything we choose. You can sit there, this is the intellectual mind, activate your higher faculties. I'm not talking here about your sensory factors, I'm talking about your higher faculties. You can exercise them and you can literally create the start of anything because you are creative. Your creative being. Do you know it's these faculties that separate you from your pets? Archibald McLeish had a character stand up in one of his plays. It's called The Secret of Freedom. He had this character stand up. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning play too. He had a character stand up and say, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. He was right. You've got marvelous faculties. Do you know that this auditorium was nothing but an image in the mind of one individual at one time? Do you know that the clothes you're wearing, the camera that I'm staring at was nothing but an idea in the mind of one individual at one time? Now I want you to imagine a hundred years ago someone saying to you, I've got an idea. I've got a picture here of building something, I'm going to call it a camera, and I'll shoot a picture of someone in Seoul, Korea, and simultaneously they're going to see it in Nacogdoches, Texas, in their family room on something we'll call a television. I'll take that picture and I'll send it zigging off through time and space, I'll bounce it off something I'm going to call a satellite, and it'll bounce right in to a receiving set on a television set in your family room. Now you know that the boys in the white coats would have been coming for that guy. <laughs> but the truth is we did it. We did it. Yet in one week this year, one week in the past year, I conducted a seminar in Toronto, Canada, in Los Angeles, California, in Auckland, New Zealand, in Honolulu, Hawaii, in one week. I could have been flying over Tahiti which I was, at 35,000 feet, going 600 miles an hour, press a button and my seat goes back, pull the thing out from underneath, and I could virtually turn it into a bed, hit another button and somebody come to my aid and they'd give me something hot or cold to drink, they'd give me something to eat, they'd give me a pair of earphones, plug into the seat and I could listen to my choice of music, or I might be able to watch a first run movie, they'd wheel a little cart down beside my seat and they'd give me a hot meal, I could wander up to the wall of the ship or the bulkhead of the plane, take a little plastic card, plastic was something that didn't even exist when I was a child, stick it in this machine, take a telephone back to my seat, and phone my office in Willowdale, Ontario, Canada, while I'm at 35,000 feet, traveling 600 miles an hour over Tahiti, just about on the opposite side of the globe. And I would have been able to take, if I wanted to, a laptop computer out of my briefcase, set it on my knee, snap a modem on it, with the telephone, communicate to my office in Willowdale. Or take a portafax again, snap that onto the phone, send a paper to my office in Willowdale. Where did all these things come from? Where do you think you got the digital watch that you have? There is only one source of supply. Every great teacher all down through history for the last 6,000 years in recorded history has told us that if we had our ear to the ground, we'd get the message. This is where everything starts. We build the picture in our mind. Do you know what our problem is? When we build that kind of a picture, we instantly say we can't do it if it's far beyond the results that we're getting. You wouldn't be able to get the picture if you couldn't do it. You can do anything you want. And you want. Now hooked up to your conscious mind, like little antennae, you have sensory factors. You can hear, see, smell, taste, and touch. And you know that's where most people get all their information through their sensory factors? They watch a TV, read a newspaper, listen to the radio, overhear conversations, and you know what most people are doing? They're talking about why something can't be done. And we're listening to it. You know, for 26 years, that's the only way I got my direction. I just did whatever the other guys were doing. 
Remember when I was 17, they said, we're joining the Navy, are you coming? Sure. <laughs> I got five years. They didn't even like it. I'd never even seen a boat, let alone a ship. Why did I do it? Well, the other guys were doing it. Just wherever they go, you know, like, <laughs> sort of in lockstep type fashion, we go through our life. The average person tiptoes through life, hoping they make it safely to death. What a dumb game. That's not a practice run. We get one shot at it. You don't have a contract to live forever, you know. If you're going to let what you do be based upon what you hear, you better make certain the people that are giving you the advice are getting phenomenal results or you're going to go where they're going. And I can be an authority on this. I am an authority on it. I spent 27 years doing it. Every waking hour, I know where they're going to lead you. Around in a circle, because that's where they're going. When an idea comes into your mind, you want to ask yourself this question. Don't ask whether it's wrong or whether it's right. See, Jan was right. There was something on the book. So was I right. There was nothing on the book. That's not the question. Do you know what the question is? Will that idea take me from where I am and move me in the direction of the star that I'm shooting at? Will it help me reach my goal? If it won't, I guarantee you it's going to take you in the other direction because you're not going to stay where you are. That is certain. That comfort zone is a dangerous place to be. It's like Riggs said, it may be comfortable, but it's a bad spot. You have the ability, when someone gives you a suggestion that takes you in a direction other than where you want to go, you have the ability to consciously and mentally just reject that idea. And then you can go ahead and originate whatever idea you want. Now, as long as an idea is in your conscious mind, it'll have absolutely no effect on your physical body or what you're doing. No effect at all. It's when you take that idea and you turn it over to this part of our mind we refer to as the subconscious. It could be called universal intelligence. It's called by many different names. Superconscious. There's about 150 some names you can put on here. The early Greeks referred to this part of our personality as the heart. You see, they pointed out that as you think in your heart, so are you. Do you know that side of your personality has no ability to reject an idea? Absolutely none. Whatever idea comes in and goes in here instantly is manifest in that physical body of yours. Now, you get ideas from outside, we instantly let them come in here and we act on them. I want you to take your hand and hold it up like that for a moment. Take your hand and hold it up like that. Now, put it here in your chin for a second. Will you do that? Where's your chin? Why did you put your hand here? Do you know why you put your hand there? Because I put my hand there. You said, well, that's what you said to do. I'm going to suggest you weren't thinking. I'm going to suggest you just let that idea go right into your subconscious and you automatically acted on the idea. If I said, follow me, I'll show you how to win. Are you just going to follow me? Where are you going to ask yourself? Does that person know what he's talking about? Does she know where she's going? Why would you go to someone for financial advice that's flat broke? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would you go to a sick doctor to find out how to get healthy? Do you want to know why we do it? We're in the habit of doing it. And you know what a habit is? A habit is something you do without giving it any conscious thought. And you know that most people live by habit. They don't think. Val Van de Waal used to point out if most people said what they were thinking, they'd probably be speechless. The late and great Dr. McFarland from down in Kentucky said 2% of the people think, 3% of the people think they think, and he said 95% of the people would rather die than think. I was reading an article that was written on uh, George Bernard Shaw. 
And the author was reporting that Shaw one time said the average person thinks two or three times a year. He said, I've gained an international reputation with myself thinking two or three times a week. I was driving over here this morning with Linda, my wife. We had a real interesting occasion this morning at the house. Colleen, my daughter, got up to have a shower and turned on the tap and took it right off in her hand. The water goes <laughs> right across the rim. And of course, being the mechanically inclined person I am, I didn't even know how to shut it off. <laughs> so we had a fountain going sideways in the bathroom. The only way Linda knew how to turn it off was shut all the water off in the house. This happened at a quarter to six this morning. Needless to say, that was a nice way to start to wash your hair and have a shower and brush your teeth. So I thought, what will I do? I could see this hole and I didn't know what to do. So I went and got a broom handle and shoved it in the hole. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. But that didn't work. Well, now, if you, if you wanted to see it, a, a comedy, you should have been in our house this morning. Here's Linda holding the tap on while Colleen's having a shower <laughs> and having a terrible time trying to adjust the hot and cold. <laughs> then Colleen scurried away with her towels around her, and in I go. <laughs> and I've got the water pouring on me, my hair full of soap, and it went ice cold. Linda said, hurry up, it's freezing. <laughs> Then she said, it's burning me. <laughs> well, we finally got the soap off and we got through the operation. And I understand there's a plumber over there doing what I'm not aware of how to do. And I have no intentions of learning either, I might tell you. But you know what she was saying on the way over? She said, well, we sure got creative early, didn't we? <laughs> Then she said something interesting. She said, you know there would be some people, that's the only time they ever originate a creative thought in their life, when they meet some kind of a catastrophe like that. And you know that's true. That is the truth. That's the only time when their back is right against the wall that they'll think of something different. What's a different way to do what you do? What's a better way to do what you do? What's a different way to strengthen your relationships? What's a better way to improve your income? Do you know if you're still running your company the way you were running it five years ago, you're going out of business? That's true. You've got to do it different. And by that I mean you've got to do it better. You've got to become more effective. You see, we live in a fast-changing world. This isn't the 50s any longer. You've got to run to keep up today. And if you're not prepared to do it better, Get out of the game, because you're really going to get hurt. But any one of us can, and I don't care what's happened in the past. You might have been losing right up to this moment, but there's no point from this moment on doing it. You see, I blew it until I was 26, but as Ray said to me, you've already paid for that. You don't have to pay twice. Start to think. And he says, if you choose an idea and you place it in here instantly and automatically, you move this thing called a body, which is nothing but a mass of energy, into a new vibration. That causes it to act different. You see, the action is caused by the vibration. If you're entertaining a negative idea, and this is the emotional mind, by the way, and you let yourself get emotionally involved in the negative idea, you instantly move your body into a negative vibration. There can be no intelligent action come from a negative vibration, ever. If energy is in a negative vibration, it must move into negative form. Science will tell you one of the first laws of energy is that energy is forever moving into form. And you know what religion calls this? They call it prayer. Prayer is the movement that takes place between spirit and form with and through an individual. Do you know most people are praying for what they don't want? They're talking about what they do want. They treat God as some cosmic bell captain that's just going to run because they spoke. But it's not the way they think. They wish positive and think negative. If you're in a negative vibration, as John will show you tomorrow, the only thing you can attract to you is something negative. How do you change? Well, one good way 
is consciously pick the people you associate with. Pick with people who are winning. Go mix with them. Do what they do. Now you're going to find that some of your family, some of your relatives, some of your friends, people that you love, are in a negative vibration. That doesn't mean you divorce yourself from them. Just don't go as often and don't stay as long. <laughs> Makes good sense. I had a good friend of mine a number of years ago, Harold Brennan. He's still a good friend of mine. Harold one time said, if you don't want to catch fleas, you don't sleep with the dog. <laughs> Not bad advice. Now, let's just change gears here a bit. You come up to a person and you say, hey, how are you today? You never hear a person say, oh, I am consciously aware that I'm in a negative vibration. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that. You know what you will hear people say? I don't feel that good. What do they mean? Well, we invented words to describe situations. Feeling is a word we invented to describe our conscious awareness of the vibration we're in. When a person says, I don't feel very good, what they're saying is, I'm consciously aware that I'm in a negative vibration. Now, because of their ignorance, and I mean that, unfortunately we use the word ignorant more often than not, we should be using the word rude. Not everyone's rude, but everyone's ignorant. We just don't know some things. But because of their ignorance, they don't know that they're causing themselves to feel bad. So they'll say, she really makes me mad. He really upset me. Oh, I'm glad you weren't there. Just made me sick. It can't make you sick. He can't make you angry. She can't upset you. You've got to do it to yourself. Boy, that's a heavy load, isn't it? I am responsible for how I feel, and you haven't got anything to do with it. You got to say, hell, I want to play that game. Fine, lose. You see, it's like Wayne Dyer said, if you think other people are the cause of your problem, you're going to have to send the rest of the world to the psychiatrist for you to get better. <laughs> now, you know how successful you're going to be trying to pull a deal like that off. <laughs> Let's become aware when we're not feeling good, when we're not doing the things that give us the results we want, we are emotionally involved with a destructive concept that we put in here ourselves. Let's consciously and deliberately build a positive idea, get emotionally involved with the positive idea, and simultaneously we move into a positive vibration, everything changes. That takes some mental strength. How do you develop? I'll tell you exactly how to develop it. Sit and watch the tape that you're watching every day for a month. Every day for a month. Say, well, I don't have to watch it every day for a month. No, you don't. You only have to until you want to, and then you don't have to any longer. It's that simple. But I'll tell you this, you hear it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and one day, bang, something's going to happen inside, and you're going to realize when you say that she upset me, that she didn't do it at all. You did it. And you know what you're going to do that day? Change it. And you'll never again Go through life thinking other people upset you. And if periodically you let somebody else stick a negative idea in your subconscious mind, <laughs> you can instantly correct your direction because at least you know where the problem lies. Is that basic? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Now follow me closely here. The ideas that you impress upon your subconscious mind over and over and over and over and over again ultimately become fixed in there. You see, what you're doing when you build these ideas that we're discussing now, what you're doing is building brain cells. Every time you think about that idea, you're giving those brain cells more strength. And in a relatively short period of time, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, the great author of the phenomenal bestseller, Psycho-Cybernetics, he pointed out 
that in approximately 21 days of doing this with an idea, that idea will become fixed in your mind, then it's more commonly referred to as a habit. A habit is an idea that's fixed in our subconscious mind, requires absolutely no conscious thought any longer to cause us to act on it. Do you know you drive your car through ideas that are fixed in your mind? When you first started to drive, you were all hands and legs. Every bit of conscious attention was on what you're doing. Same as when you first learned to get dressed. You ever watch a little child trying to learn how to tie its shoe? Totally awkward. Now we get dressed without giving it any thought. You may think of what we're going to wear, but not how we're going to get it on. You very rarely see an adult trying to pull their pants on over their head. But it's not uncommon to watch a little child try and do that. You never see an adult trying to put their foot in the sleeve of their shirt. But it's not uncommon to see a little child trying to do that. But when the little child gets the ideas fixed in their mind, they never try and do that again. And they just automatically get dressed. If you would consciously observe some of the things you do in any given day, just consciously stop and watch your own behavior. Listen to your thoughts. You're going to find that many of the things you do are done through habit. See, when I was a little boy, my teachers used to say, Bob, why are you doing that? And I'd say, I don't know. This is the intellectual mind. You can store a lot of information there. But this is the conditioned mind. You see, thousands and thousands of habits form something called conditioning. And I was automatically doing things I didn't want to do. I was doing something wrong. It was giving me results I didn't want. And they'd say, why are you doing that? And I'd say, I don't know. They'd say, what do you mean you don't know? You know. I'd say, I know. <laughs> well, why are you doing it? I don't know. I remember I joined the Navy, my commanding officer would say, Proctor, why are you doing that? I'd say, I don't know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? You know. I know. Why are you doing it? I don't know. <laughs> then I got out of the Navy and I went to work and the boss would say, Bob, why are you doing that? I'd say, I don't know. I'd say, what do you know? What do you mean? You know how to do better. I know. Why don't you do it? I don't know. Then I get married, my wife say, why are you doing that? I say, never mind. <laughs> it's amazing how bold you get at times. I got to hate the word why. I didn't know why I was doing things that I didn't want to do, giving me results I didn't want to get. I didn't know how my mind operated. I didn't know I had all those ideas fixed in there. And I'll tell you something else I didn't know. I didn't know how to change it. I did not know how to change it. Why did I have a poor attitude? Because I had so many negative ideas fixed in here. And you see, it's what's in here that controls the vibration. And conscious awareness of the vibration is called feeling. And I never felt very good. Sometimes I felt lower than others. You'll see people that are totally depressed. You know what depression is? Depression is anger turned inwards. They get anger at someone else and they suppress it. They pack it into their subconscious until it all becomes fixed. And they stay in a terrible vibration. Why do you think people get ill? Do you think disease is a normal vibration for a body to be in? Not at all. Ignorance is the cause of disease. We're told to know the truth. The truth would set us free. There's only one thing to be set free from, my friend, and that's ignorance. Now, I want you to stop and think of just how you behave. I want you to stop and think of some of the things that you could do that would improve the quality of your life just like that. Every one of us know how to do things better than we're doing. Our problem has been we don't know why we're not doing them. See, you know that when you leave home, if you go over and say, you know, honey, I really love you, and give them a little hug and kiss, you feel better when you leave. You also know when you go out and slam the door that you feel bad for a long time after, and so do the people that you slam the door on. We know, but sometimes we still slam the door. Do you know if that's the only thing you changed? If that was the only habit you changed, 
the quality of that relationship would improve. I have watched salespeople multiply their effectiveness just by forming the habit of being like this at 9 a.m. in the morning. This is called personal contact, and it's the key to success. Some people are not in front of a prospect until noon. You'll never get up at the crack of noon and win. <laughs> at least if you can, I'd like you to tell me about it. The rest of this program is built around that basic concept and this basic concept here. But understand this, you've got the mental faculties, you've certainly got the power. The power's always with you. It's always flowing to and through. It's just a matter of learning how to direct it. And in learning how to direct it, happiness, health, and prosperity will manifest in your life, and they should because that's your birthright. And there isn't one person in this room, one person in your life that is even that much better than you. We're all the same. The difference is in our results. Change your results by changing our mind. It's so basic and so simple. I want to suggest that you consciously make a decision to change one habit in your life. I'd like to introduce you to someone that I love dearly, my aunt, Marg Moyer. She was in the habit of letting other people think for her. What everybody else wanted to do, I would do. You know, you wouldn't start an argument or, or um, you know, hurt anybody's feelings. And you waited on people continually. Marg changed one habit and she literally changed her life. I'll tell you one thing, she's a force to be reckoned with today. A nicer person too. Well, if you were to tell me something and I didn't agree with you, I could tell you, no, I don't agree with that. No, I don't wait on anybody. I think anybody that comes to this home will know that because once you're here once, um, after that you get your own coffee. <laughs> you know, we started our own business and uh, we really worked. And we worked extremely hard and the whole family worked and now everybody reaps the benefits. I would never have had the uh, inner security to start a business. Now you decide, what habit are you going to change? What have you been doing automatically, without any conscious thought? Pick one and make up your mind, like Marg, you're gonna change. Marg not only brought a not lot more of herself to the surface to enjoy, her whole family enjoy her more. You pick one habit and make a similar change in your life. Now John Canary is going to introduce you to your greatest power. Now I'm gonna ask you to take a look at a picture. I'm going to bring a picture up close to you. First of all, I'm going to hold it up. Some of you have seen this before, but I'm going to ask you, some of you, to tell me what is it you really see. Now, if I were to go over here to Paul and say, Paul, what is it you actually see when I ask you to take a look at this picture? What do you see, Paul? You see a skull. Andy, tell me, what were you able to see? You were able to see a skull. Now, if I take a closer walk over here to someone here, what is your name, sir? Jim. Jim, what did you see? I saw a skull. You saw a skull. Jim, can you just walk up here for a moment? I just want to get you on camera here and get you to take a closer look at this. And just take a look and tell me, yes or no, is that a skull? No, it's not a skull. It's not a skull. As a matter of fact, Jim, is it a beautiful picture if you take a closer look? It's kind of a nice picture. Yeah, it's kind of a nice picture. Thanks a lot, Jim. I appreciate that. Now you see, the closer that I get to you with this picture, you're going to start to see something completely different than what you thought you were looking at. You see, you instantly said, that's a skull. You remember this morning Robert talked about cells of recognition. And you were able to see this with your eyes. Your eyes picked it up and sent a transmission of energy to cells in your brain. Cells in your brain. Those cells were triggered or moved into a, a, a speed of vibration, a high amplitude of vibration, and flashed a picture on the screen of your mind. The picture you were able to describe is a skull. But you know something? That's not true. 
You know what I've got here. Isn't that correct? Do you know what I've got here, Tammy? You see, some of us in here have exactly the same picture of what's in this skull. What it is, is a beautiful lady looking in a mirror. Now, there is no way, unless you get a close look at this, can you see a beautiful lady looking in a mirror. There is just no way that you can actually see it unless you get close. I want you to think about something, and it's extremely important. Do you know that some of us, since we were infants, have been doing certain things in a certain way because of a belief system we've fallen in love with, and we protect that belief system even in favor of the truth. Even in favor of the truth. There are people who will die for tradition even if it means learning the truth. On the very first page of this particular lesson, page 11, at the very top, it's referred to as your greatest power. Your greatest power. And I want you to follow through this particular lesson with me as I begin to work with it on the board a little bit. But at the very top, when you were an infant, and in the early years of your life, the ability to control what energy or ideas were entering your subconscious mind had not yet been developed. In other words, the age of reason, before the age of reason, before we ate of what is called that tree of knowledge. I'm talking about, you could say, our little life. Long before we were able to say yay or nay. Now there's a question I want you to ask yourself as I get into this. And the question goes like this. Who and or what is in control of my life? Who and or what is in control of my life? Now, George Bernard Shaw one time put it this way. He said, it seems that people are forever blaming their circumstance for who and what they are. I, he said, don't believe in circumstance. The people who get on in this world, who come up with the results, are the people who look for the circumstance they want and if they can't find them, then they go back and they make them. Then they go back and they make them. So let's just maybe take a look at how we learn some of the things we've learned. First of all, let's understand that we are all a confluence of a genetic structure. You could say that you, you, our, our genetic structure makes up a lot of what we believe and a lot of what we are, but not near as important as our environment. I one time heard Earl Nightingale make a statement that went like this. He said, all kinds of studies have been made regarding motivation. What is it, he said, that motivates us to do the things we do, to achieve the things we achieve? And he said, while there's no pet answer to so large and complicated a question, he said, we believe that the overriding force that motivates people is due to choice of environment. Now he said, some people make this choice consciously, but a great majority of people make this choice unconsciously as a result of environmental condition. Now let's just go back into our little life for a moment. A very simple little exercise, but yet you see, even though we know it, it doesn't mean we are actually implementing the understanding of it. And you can say there is our outside world that has the predominant influence in the life of a child and what that child becomes. Now think about it. Here is a child who was born in absolute perfection. Maybe not physically speaking, but from a spiritual point of view, this child was born absolutely perfect. And in the beginning, they have the ability to think they have the ability to reason. They have all the intellectual factors 
somewhere resonant within their mind, but they're not yet developed. Consequently, their mind is wide open for any idea that is going to come down the tube. Let me give you a good example of that. If I were to just come over here and I were to speak to you, Anik, Mr. Kavuk, Mr. Kavuk, if I were to ask you what religion you are, if you had to name one, what would it be? Christian. Now let's keep in mind that there are what? There are 47 types of Christianity in California alone. Now, what, would your, what are your children, Onik? They're Christian. Now, uh, were they born Christians, Onik? They were born Christians. Now, here's the point. Here's a brand new baby, and we'll just call this baby uh, Billy or Julie. And one of the things that the baby is going to learn is about that symbol. Is that right? Yes, or, yes, no. The baby is going to learn something about that symbol, just as Onik was just telling me. That's an idea that the baby is going to learn. But let's understand how the baby learns to begin with. How many people have a young baby? How many? All right. What's the baby's name? Rebecca. What is it? <laughs> Rebecca. How old is the baby? 11 months. Now, uh, Rebecca is being spoon-fed by now. Is that correct, Dad? Yes, yeah, the, Rebecca is being spoon-fed. Now, here's what happened. Now, when you first got Rebecca, did you say, your name is Rebecca and don't you ever forget it? Is that what happened the first day you brought her home? <laughs> okay. now, now, isn't it true that uh, if you notice Rebecca that at a certain point in her life there, I don't know how many weeks it was, but she, there's a hand. She's looking at this hand she's holding up. And she's wondering, what is this? They start to examine this hand. They're wondering, what is that? It takes them a while to find out that it belongs to them because they take it and they bite it and then they know it belongs to them. <laughs> and they take the same thing with their foot and you know, they're wondering where did this come from? Well, Bob mentioned this morning, I am not a physical instrument, I am a, and I have, and I live in, all right. Well, you see, Rebecca is a spiritual creature. And Rebecca, for the most part, is going to learn about Rebecca from the people by whom she is surrounded in her outside world. That's how Rebecca is going to learn. But do you know there's a certain point in Rebecca's life, and you know it could be, it could be now, could be later, but there's a day that Rebecca is going to go through some introspection, and this is what Rebecca is going to say silently in her heart, in her heart of hearts. There's a little thing written by Adele Davis, and it goes like this. Who is this person, this person called I? How many times, maybe, have you been blue? How many times have you been blue and maybe looked at a friend and said, hey, gosh, hey, gosh, I wish I were you? Or how many times have you attempted to change, say, your whole life's pattern and to rearrange? Rebecca doesn't know. She doesn't know why she feels the way she feels. Well, you see, this is the way that Rebecca started to learn. If we were to just take and say, Rebecca is going to learn to eat off the spoon, this is what will happen. Mom will take a spoon. Rebecca's mind is wide open. She's crying for the food. And Mom will take the spoon. She'll start to go like this. Come on, honey. Open your mouth now. Open it wide. Open up, Rebecca. But Rebecca doesn't open up. That's why she has food all over her. She's got it all over the clothes. But mom continues to go, open wide, honey. And eventually little Rebecca starts to do what? She starts to emulate who? Mom. And she starts to open her mouth. Then goes the spoon. She identifies now. There's been an idea or there's been an image fixed in little Rebecca's mind. Do you know this is going to continue as Rebecca begins to grow up? I'm going to say things to her like, you're just like your father. <laughs> you make me so angry. And all these ideas now are being impregnated or are being impressed in this little girl's mind to the point where they make up the concept, the belief system, or the idea, or what Rebecca 
comes to believe is true about her, her world that she lives in. What happens when Rebecca starts to eat of this tree of knowledge where she develops the ability to reason, the ability to choose? Do you know, now that Rebecca can think, let's not make the mistake of believing that because she can think that she is actually thinking. As Dr. Ken McFarland said, Bob was referring to, 2% of the people think, 3% of the people think they think, 95% of the people rather die than think. Rebecca is not necessarily thinking. Let me give you a good example. What is it that's causing Rebecca to do the things that she's doing? We know it's got to be the conditioned mind. Good, bad, or indifferent, it is the ideas that have been impregnated in her subconscious or her conditioned mind. Let me give you a good example. One day Rebecca is going out and she's doing a little bit of shopping with mom. And they get in this car and they start down the street. And Rebecca leans into the front seat. Now remember, she now has the ability to reason. But it doesn't mean she is. She is a product to a large extent of her environment. And she leans in the front seat and she says, Mommy, 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 wh where are all those dumb bastards today? <laughs> well, Mom's got all the wisdom. Mom is thinking, you see, she grabs the steering wheel, thinks about it, says, Oh, honey, you just relax. Because they only come out when your father is driving. <laughs> Was that little girl doing something wrong? Did she say anything wrong? Not in her mind. But you see, the day that mom begins to explain it to her will give her cause to think or give her cause to reason. It is then and only then that she can change the information that has been handed over to the conditioned mind. That has been handed over to the conditioned mind. Now go back to your workbook because we've got to cover these couple of pages. Go back to your workbook right now. Go down a little further where James Allen made a great quote. He said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Was he talking about the physical pump here? No, he was talking about the heart of hearts. He said, as a man thinketh in his heart. Now he didn't say as a man and not a woman. He didn't say a man and a woman, not a child. He didn't say a person who works at Ford, but not one at General Motors. He didn't say a black person, but not a white person. He said the heart of hearts, because the heart of hearts, you see, has no complexion. The heart of hearts doesn't care where you live. The heart of hearts doesn't care who you know. It doesn't care what you have. The heart of hearts states that any idea you turn over to me, like to Rebecca, if Rebecca was taught an idea that was not good for Rebecca, Rebecca will act out that idea, good, bad, or indifferent, because the idea states that as a person thinketh in their heart, so they will be in their action, in their results, in their life. So you see, maybe in the beginning, someone was in control of Rebecca's life. But it reaches a point where no one is in control of Rebecca's life anymore. And this is what I want to see if we can get through here before too long. Now, help me on this page. It says, you're no longer an infant. You do have control over what enters your subconscious mind, whether you're exercising that control or not exercising it is another subject. You know, a mother got up one morning, she yelled up the stairs, she said, son, get ready, we're going, you got to get going to school. He yelled down, I'm not going. You have to. Give me two good reasons why I should. Well, she said, the first one is you're 40, and the second one is you're the principal. <laughs> so we're no longer an infant. Go along here with me again, if you will. 
You can control what enters your subconscious mind, and furthermore, you definitely have the God-given ability to change the old conditioning. You know, I don't think there is anything greater that you can learn about you than that statement. You see, your present conditioning is your personal life, what you have, what you believe you are. It is your family life, and it is your business life. It is your income. It is everything about you. That is a reflection of your own conditioning. I remember one time I put on a, a particular tape by a guy named Earl Nightingale. And Nightingale said this. It was probably one of the better things I've ever heard. Nightingale said that your world and everything in it is a reflection of your own mental attitude toward yourself. This world that you live in, that you see, and everything you believe it to be, it is a reflection of your own mental attitude towards yourself. So here we have what is called the old conditioning. That's what we are today, regardless of where that might be. And here we are with a new idea. In other words, we are living with a belief system, as you see over there, and what we are attempting to do sometimes is to develop a new constructive or a bigger idea. As someone mentioned to me today, well, I don't know how to do it. You know what? There isn't a soul alive that knows how to reach a goal until they reach it. There isn't one living soul alive that knows how to reach a goal until they reach it. And even a person who has can't tell a person who hasn't until they reach it. Only then will they know. But you know, there's some good news. Albert Einstein had something burned in the corner of his desk that he said was responsible for every great invention he ever brought about. And this is what he had burned into his desk. That all creation waits. Now think now. All creation, he said, all creation waits with eager longing for the revealing through the sons of man. That's you, and it's me, and it's those around you. In other words, the way to do anything you want to do, it's all ready here, but you've got to use something to work with it. You've got to use your ability to reason, your ability to choose, your ability to think. You've got to use it. And we're going to cover those two areas because, you see, you can reason two ways, and that's what we're going to touch on here. Now, go through with me, then, the last paragraph in this page. You can control what enters your subconscious mind, and furthermore, you definitely have the God-given ability to change the old condition. And by doing this, you can transform your life. Now, that's what a behavioral scientist would say. Let's go over to the other side, to the philosopher, the theologian. What would they say? Let's go back to a guy by the name of Paul. He was a pretty bright guy. He used to walk along the shores of Galilee there, and he was picking up and learning as well. And he said something like this. He said that if you want to be transformed, he said, be not of this world. Now, he didn't mean to leave it. What he was pointing out is what you must do is be not of this world of conditions and circumstance. Be not of what already is. But he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your conditioning, the renewing of an idea. In other words, replace one idea with a new idea. All right. Would you turn the page, please? Just turn the page over to page 12. What is the purpose of the intellectual factors you see at the top of this page? It says, your conscious mind has been endowed with intellectual factors. We know that. This little girl has been endowed with intellectual factors. But in the beginning, they were not able to guard or to protect her against all the information she was getting. You know that Rebecca, you wouldn't do a thing on earth to harm Rebecca. Isn't that true, Dad? There isn't anything you'd ever do to harm Rebecca. 
But you know, Dad doesn't know everything there is to know about living. And Rebecca is going to be exposed to so many things. Let me give you an example of how Rebecca starts to use what are called her intellectual factors just quickly. Now you could bounce over here and this is Rebecca now at the age of reason. And Rebecca goes to school. And as she's in there with all the other kids in school, the teacher takes and she puts something on the board for all the kids. And this is what it is. C-A-T. Rebecca does not know what that means. She may have a cat at home, but she doesn't know what it is in a word form. The teacher knows they have sensory factors. Rebecca can see that. She can see cat sends a transmission of energy to cells in her brain. They increase in amplitude of vibration, but there is no picture other than a blank one. So the teacher has to build some cells of recognition. She's going to start to use now her intellectual factors, and this is how she'll do it. She'll say, now class, that's C-A-T. I want you all to repeat after me. She'll say, that's K-A-T. Now I want everybody to say that in the room here. Come on. K-A-T. Okay. Now I want you to say K-A-T, and I want you to say it a little bit faster. Come on. K-A-T, cat, 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 cat. And a picture jumps into little Rebecca's mind, a beautiful little fluffy at home. Now she has a word and she has a picture to identify with it. But you know, on her way home, she's all excited to go home and tell Dad everything that she's learned. She goes dashing through this construction site. And as she goes dashing through, takes shortcut, this guy yells out, Hey, Charlie, bring that big cat over here. On go the brakes. What is she looking for? She's looking for little Fluffy, but what does she see? A big, giant, earth-moving machine. Now she has two pictures for one word. Two pictures, one word. She goes home, she says, Mommy, Daddy, a uh, teacher told me all about Fluffy, C-A-T, and I'm going home here, and the man yelled. And I see this, oh, no, honey, that was a caterpillar. Now she's got three pictures for one word. But you see, they explain it to her, and something goes away, and it's called confusion. Now I want you to think about this. At some point in your life, in your little life, you were taught things about money, about love. You were taught things about God. You were taught things about work. You were given things about people. Things about people. You were given things and taught things about you. Never measure up. Never amount to anything. You're just like your mother or your father. You're just like your uncle. You can't trust anybody. All red-headed people have bad tempers. <laughs> now, if you ever met Bob, you'd know that's not true. So you see, we have all been taught these things as we started to grow in our life. And now we get to a point in our life where we start thinking about what is it I want to do? I was talking to Paul a little earlier now. He goes to university here. Why is Paul going to university? Has Paul really decided on something Paul wants to accomplish? Because you see, now we're at a point where we start to think about what we want to do, but sometimes our conditioning gets in the way. Now this is very important. I mentioned we can reason two ways. What are they? We can reason inductively, and we can reason deductively, and I want you all to say it with me. We can reason deductively, and we can reason deductively. You know one of the reasons that we do not continue to think and try to look for new and better ways to do what we want to do, to be what we want to be, and to get to where we want to go? Because we don't do it long enough. 
I said something this morning that if you put a little bit in, you get a... But if you put a whole lot in, you get a... Now, this is important on what I'm going to do here. Very important. When we start to use the idea that I'm just going to share with you here and just get through this workbook, I want you to think about this. There is a season to sow. There is a season to reap. But we don't do both in the same season. Now, at the count of three, I'm going to ask you all to do it with me, that there's a season to sow, there's a season to reap, but you don't do both in the same season. Are you ready? Now, I want you all to do it with me. Come on. One, two, three. There's a season to sow. There's a season to reap. But you don't do both in the same season. Sowing and reaping. There's something in the seminar that is very, very dear to me. And uh, I know in every seminar that I, I make a strong point and I emphasize this point. And of course, I emphasize it because of what it's meant to me. But I always mention that there's a season to sow, there's a season to reap, but we don't do both in the same season. I want to say that to people, you know, they, they seem to walk away at least with a, an intellectual understanding that, yeah, that's true. But somehow I don't feel that they actually take and they do it long enough. They don't sow long enough. The farmer understands it. They go out and they sow the seeds. After a period of time, they, they know that that's the one season. And then, then the next season, they go out and they reap it. And then, of course, by putting both of those together and doing them to the best of their ability, in other words, do the best you can to sow it, nourish it, preserve it, take care of it, look after it, you know that in the next season you're going to get a great crop. Uh, for me, the sowing was the five years that I spent at the seminars. There was no money. I had to pay my own way. And I understood that, of course. So I spent five years sowing it. And believe me, there was many, many times that I was checking to see whether or not there was anything growing. And you have a tendency to lose faith a lot. But I know now that when I speak to an individual about that, I can say it with conviction. I can say it with commitment. Because, you see, I spent the season sowing. I, of course, have, as far as the season of reaping, um, it's been more reaping than there has been sowing. It, it just seems that it comes back tenfold. Uh, I remember an expression I've heard time and time again, uh, where the laborers are very few, but the harvest is great. And uh, I believe, again, that's a result of a person's ignorance that they believe because they do something today, they should benefit tomorrow. We don't know when the season of reaping is, but we do know when the season of sowing is. And that's every living, breathing moment that we have an opportunity to provide a service or put the best into what we're doing. We know then that the result is guaranteed. That's what the law of compensation is based on. You take care of the sowing, something far greater. The universe will respond in like kind in perhaps another season. I don't know when that season might be, but I do know that it must respond in like kind, and you will reap what you sow. So that's very, been very important to me. We can reason, I said, two ways. We can reason inductively, and we can reason deductively. Do you know the moment that you begin to entertain a new idea? If your conditioning is evaluating that idea, you may reject that idea only because of your old conditioning. But chances are even good that a person who has experienced a lot of good results in their life, when they're presented with a constructive idea, their conditioning will evaluate that idea as a good constructive idea to move on to another dimension in their life. <coughs> Think about it this way. Inductively, we have the ability to gather what is called facts. I'm going to give you a good example. There was a man one time who took a $5 bar of iron. And with that $5 bar of iron, he started to really think, what can I do with it? Well, what have they done with it so far? Well, they use it as a paperweight. They use it to keep a door open. But he started to really think. He was using his inductive factor. 
His critical factor, his logical factor, his creative nature, he was using that to figure out, what can I do with this $5 bar of iron? In other words, he was thinking. And he started to put some facts together as to what he could do with this $5 bar of iron. That's what he found. He found a way to make kitchen cutlery by using and gathering facts and gathering information and bringing from the spiritual plane by bringing thought. The greatest power in all creation. Power of thought. And he started to pull in these thoughts to figure out, what can I do with this $5 bar of iron? He found a way to make kitchen cutlery. And he sold it for $250. But someone else came along and they gathered one more piece of information. They started to gather a little more information. I can do something more with that $5 bar of iron. And they arrived at a premise. What's a premise? It's an idea. Science approach every subject with an idea or the premise that there is an answer. He approached the new idea with the $5 bar of iron that there was a better thing to do with it than kitchen cutlery and he found it. And he made balance springs and put them in your watch. And he sold it for $250,000. I want you to think about you as a $5 bar of iron. Really stop and think about you as a $5 bar of iron. Because you see, if you're not thinking, you are going to leave your mind open to a world of conditions and to a world of circumstance. You will be totally deductive to why something won't work, to people who say it won't work, to all the adversities that are going to go wrong, to the economy and to everybody in it. You'll become totally deductive to the fact that it won't work. That's going to happen to us from time to time. But if you're not thinking, then your mind is idle. And Napoleon Hill will say, right in that book, Think and Grow Rich, this is what he said. He said, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. You've got to specifically stop and think about almost every idea that's presented to you. Is it something that will enhance my life? Rather than becoming totally deductive to it. Let's see how well you remember that. Would you just take your hand like that once more? Let's see if you remember. And just take it and place it on your cheek like that. Now, where's your cheek? <laughs> oh, some of you were going right along with me there, weren't you? All right. So on this page, we're talking about, we have the intellectual factors of reason, intuition, perception, perception will, memory, and imagination. We will never, ever use them if we don't invoke our inductive factor or the ability to think. Tremendous power, tremendous potential, tremendous things wait for everybody who will actually use their intellectual factors to work with this phenomenal potential. So on page 13, your deductive reasoning factor does not have the ability to reject ideas. Think about it. Your inductive reasoning factor does not have the ability to reject an idea. How often have we become totally, totally subjective to an idea or to a group of people without giving it any thought or consideration? It only has the ability to accept and turn over to the treasury of the subconscious mind whatever is offered to it. When your inductive reasoning factor is inoperable, set aside or not engaged, you are not thinking for yourself. Now you must follow this book with me. It is vitally vitally important. If you were in a very positive environment when your conscious mind was in a deductive state, you would automatically become the benefactor of that positive energy that you're surrounded by. It says, however, if your conscious mind was in a deductive state and you were in a negative environment, you would automatically become the benefactor of all the negative energy your senses come into contact with. Says your negative energy comes from many sources, people, papers, television, radio, even loved ones. It passes directly through your conscious mind and causes you to feel or vibrate in a like manner. Think about that. Napoleon Hill often talked about, or often talks about, 
He talks about, he said, I want you to imagine, he said that there's an energy constantly flowing to, with, and through you. And he said that this energy is flowing not only with, to, and through you, but also around you. And he said that energy is affecting people around you, just as their energy is affecting you and the people around them. And the people around them. A person who was continually in a negative environment and whose consciousness is deductive will very quickly become a product of that environment. What is meant by if their consciousness is deductive? In other words, if your belief system lends itself to persisting no more than a day and you are around people whose consciousness will not persist any more than a day, the chances of you ever changing that persistence and staying in that environment are not very good. Are not very good. Let's go to the next page. The inductive reasoning factor. At the top, your inductive reasoning factor is your thinker. It is referred to in some circles as the critical or analytical factor. This is the part of your personality that actually separates you from all the rest of the animal kingdom, and it gives you dominion over the, your world. Do you remember something over there in Genesis 126? What did it say? You were given dominion over what? The fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that creepeth on the earth. Do you think they referred to everything other than your results? Did they mean, Dan, everything but your income? Did they mean everything but your happiness? Did they mean everything but your health? We don't have time to go into the story, but I can tell you a story about health, just as far as my own, uh, my, my own family is concerned, about Maureen, who was very, very ill at one time. But she refused to give in to a life-threatening illness. She wouldn't become deductive to the fact that she could not become healthy again. <coughs> she thought of all the reasons why she could and all the reasons how she was going to. And she would not listen or permit anyone who suggested anything remotely different. Anything remotely different than what she wanted to be, what she wanted to do, where she wanted to go. She wouldn't accept it. She wouldn't accept it. This is the part of your personality that actually separates you from the rest of the animal kingdom and gives you dominion over. Properly developed and applied. Your inductive reasoning factor will turn you on and turn you into an excellent channel for creative energy to flow through. At the present time, presently, you are vibrating in a notion of magnificent thought and energy. Well, we'll be getting into that a lot more tomorrow. But I want you to imagine yourself for a moment, if you could. Just stop and think. Like, just close your eyes for a moment. Go ahead and do that. Just close your eyes. Everyone close their eyes. And just imagine yourself living in this ocean of motion. Just imagine it. Picture it. You see this tremendous, tremendous mind stuff. An intelligence, if you will. Just imagine it. You're plugging into it. Right now you're doing that. You're plugging into it. And you are drawing from it right now. As you stop and think, as you can see it, you are actually drawing from it. Pulling from it. Do you know that of all the good of this universe, we're poured over each person in this room, the only amount of that good that you can have is yours only by right of your consciousness. The only amount you can have is the amount you're able to understand. You can only have what is yours by right of consciousness. Let's continue in the book. When these thoughts are brought together, they build creative ideas that can change your old conditioning and literally build your world more beautiful than you previously could have imagined. Let me tell you something that I, I just have absolutely no problem with anymore with regard to taking a number of thoughts. Bob mentioned this morning something about water. Water is energy at a certain state of vibration. Yes, no? Yes. In other words, it is two hydrogen atoms and one at a certain state of 
Think about this. Success is energy, a certain group of thoughts that form an idea at a certain state of vibration. Success is nothing more but energy in its most organized state of vibration. Failure, therefore, would be energy, a certain group of thoughts vibrating against natural law, known as confusion. It is energy in its most confused state of vibration. Is that difficult? I don't think so. What is health? It is an orderly state of vibration. But to achieve it, we must invoke and use our inductive factor, what we're talking about here. So when these thoughts are brought together, they build creative ideas that can change your old conditioning and literally build your world more beautiful than you previously could have imagined. You must, however, you must, however properly plant these creative ideas in the treasury of your subconscious mind, the part of your mind that transforms every impression that enters in it into physical form. The word was turned into flesh. Think about that. What is the word? It is the formulation of your thoughts into an idea. That's when it becomes the word transformed into a reality or in the form of a result. I'm asking you to examine that idea. Just examine it. In big black print in your book, I want you to really look at it. Will this idea improve the quality of my life? How many people here for some time now, have had a great desire on something they want to be, something they want to do, and something they want to have. How many people have actually desired something that you have not yet accomplished? Now, honestly, would you put your hands up? Hold them way up high there. Hold them way up high. Just keep them up there for a minute. Now, let them down, and let me ask you this. With respect to this idea, isn't it true you have had ways on how you can achieve it? Yes, no. Isn't it true that ideas have come to your mind on things that you should do, but you've rejected them because of why? Say it louder. Fear. Fear. Or is it old conditioning? Does the old conditioning tell you why you can't do it? Does it act as a reminder as to what went wrong the last time? Isn't it true that the last time someone told you, hey, you shouldn't do this, you failed, so you should listen to the next person again? So we've got to start using not our old conditioning, not being deductive. We've got to start to use what? Inductive, inductive reasoning. What is inductive reasoning? Tell me. Is it just thinking or thinking about? Yeah, and remember, now we're not talking about just mental gymnastics here. We're talking about working with the power of thought. Thinking is working with the power of thought. I don't know how many people are familiar with a place called Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. Well, that's where I come, I come from, Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. It's not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. And it's a little coal mining town. No, that's really a different place here. It's a little coal mining town just down, down Nova Scotia there. Quite a place. And I can remember my dad coming home there every day, every day, every day, and he had this big light on the top of a big hat, big, big hat to protect his head because he worked out under the sea in the coal mines. And he'd have all these old clothes on, and they'd be all dirty and black, and they, he just looked awful, and he'd come home and home and home and home and home and home. And a lot of people here know my dad pretty well. Uh, he, he used to say, it's all you got to do is work hard, and it's all you got to do is be honest, and you're going to win. Now, that's only partly true. Hill said in his book, I'm going to have to hurry this up now. Hill pointed out in his book, until he said, we perish such foolish thoughts that working hard and being honest will bring us the desired riches. He said, we'll never change the result until we learn that we must invoke, implement, become aware of. He said, this power of thought, and it's only reached, he said, through the inductive factor or through the ability to think. That's what thinking is. It is working with the power of thought to improve the conditions that you presently have and not allowing yourself to become deductive to all the reasons why it can. So let me kind of bring this in for a landing then at the bottom here. If when an idea enters your mind and it's happening all the time at a fraction of a second, 
the answer to the above question is yes, then the idea is very likely good for you. Will the ideas that you have held that enter your mind from time to time on how you can achieve a desire, the next time that idea enters your mind and you say, will this idea improve my life, you've got to act on the idea. There's a gentleman I talked to at lunch down here. I hope you're listening. Hope you're listening. Over on page 15, quick exercise. John Canary made reference to page 15 and 16 in your action planner. They're vitally important pages. It's absolutely essential that you answer these questions. Go over them and really think. What we're doing is looking at where we are in our life right now financially. Let me touch on a couple of the questions. In your present position, how much money do you earn? How much have you earned up to this point in your life? If you converted everything you owned into cash and paid any outstanding debts, how much money would you have? Now, there's a couple of questions here that frequently raise questions in our seminar. Do you think any person is worth a million dollars a year or more? And there's another one by George Bernard Shaw, and we're using this within the context of earning money where he said it is a sin to be poor. Do you agree with Shaw's statements? Now consider this for a moment. If money is reward we receive for service rendered, and we render a lot of service, it would necessarily follow that we would be worth a lot of money. And if we keep in mind that money is a servant and you're the master, and that you can extend the service that you render far beyond your own physical presence if you have enough money, I think we will realize what George Bernard Shaw said was accurate. It is a sin to be poor. If we haven't got much money, we're just not rendering much service. And I think the greatest is the servant. Answer those questions accurately. And realize this, if it doesn't look too good, that's not bad. At least you know where you're at. And as we get into the next part of this program, we can show you then how to get to where you want to go. Remember I pointed out it's absolutely essential that you have a goal if you're going to get the best out of this program? And at the end of the first cassette that you had, we give you a suggestion of possibly a trip to one of these paradise islands. How about a new automobile? Would you like a new automobile? If you could have any kind of car you wanted, what would you have? Pass the torch one to another. Carry the flame as far as you can. Pass the torch, sister to brother.